Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk on uh, startup on Linux. Um, we'll start up with the usual slide of who are we um, and what do we do. Um, we are Stefan Richards and Michael von Zetritz, or as some people from the CCC context might know me, Tofu. Um, both of us are functional safety engineers in software with some background in Linux and Linux kernel. Um, and we work for Emlix, which I think is hard to miss around here at the moment, um, who uh, works in embedded uh, Linux, Linux BSPs, um, and uh, Linux around safety contexts, um, with offices in Göttingen, Bonn, and Berlin, and everywhere remote. Um, this talk in particular, and the work that we're presenting in this talk, um, has been created with our partner Electrobit, who are experts in automotive safety and automotive software, um, and have worked with us on that. Um, all of this is happening in the context of embedded industrial um, use cases. So for those of you who work on maybe more webby things or front end things, what do we mean with embedded industrial use cases? Um, we think about all these beautiful, nice things um, that might need or want Linux on them um, and can benefit from uh, the possibilities of that, um, but have some more stringent requirements as to how you use Linux in that than you might do with um, other bits of software. So back to the topic of today's talk, how can we start an application under Linux safely? Um, for us, the first question is, when I say safely, what even is going wrong? What, what, what am I thinking about when I say what goes wrong? And why do I even worry about that? And then bigger question, what do I even mean by safely? Because I think if we survey all of you about what means safety and safely, then we get very different answers across the board. So when we talk about safety, we come on along with the beautiful word of functional safety as Wikipedia defines freedom. Functional safety is freedom from unacceptable risk of physical injury or damage to the health of people by the proper implementation of one or more automatic protection functions. And because everyone would still understand something differently, there's a whole lot of different standards that um, define a whole lot of things that you can do to uh, mitigate your risk and think about risk and even assess your risk. So the parent norm being the IEC 61508, um, which is a more general norm. And then there's a whole lot of norms that roughly follow the 61508 um, for different industry standards, the 26262 or 26262, depending on who you ask, um, being the car norm. And then there's medical norms and then trains and planes, I think. Um, and then I think another very important bit when talking about functional safety is differentiating functional safety from um, other bits of safety, um, which I think often get mixed in and need a bit of differentiation. So um, when we talk about functional safety, that doesn't mean that we solely think about things like security, and particularly if you are German speakers, pretty much all of this maps to the same German word and makes it hard sometimes to differentiate these. So safety has different aspects. Security with the malicious intent is one part of it. But for us in functional safety, that's a whole different thing because I'm thinking about much more things than malicious intent to my system and thinking about all the other things that could go wrong. Does my hardware die? Does a meteor hit my hardware? Maybe risk assessment, not so likely. I don't care about meteorites. Um, and then with the functional safety, a lot of that works with repeating patterns of things, processes that we follow. And the very central bit, which we'll come back to again and again, is that we think about analysis. We analyze what is our risk. We think about do we mitigate that or do we not mitigate it because the risk is, ex is acceptable. We reduce our risk, repeat, and eventually we're happy and get the magical seal of approval. Um, and with the whole thinking about risk, 
Another important bit is there's different levels of acceptable risk, which most of you might have seen in some form or another, with probabilities and assessments over how much risk is tolerable over my risk, um, which gets you into certain gradings. All the norms have their own gradings. Um, in car norms, that might be ASIL levels. In IEC norms, that's just ZIL levels. Um, and then you have to do more or less of those repeating patterns to mitigate more and more risk. So with that out of the way, let's get back to something more, slightly more concrete. Um, now we've talked about safely, but there's still a lot of uncertainty in how I can start an application on the Linux safely, because where the hell does starting start and where does starting end? And what even happens during starting? Um, so for me, as a functional safety engineer, starting isn't I hit enter on my computer and it starts, but there's a whole lot more that can happen before that. Has the engineer put in the right binary into my image? Has, I don't know, the engineer done other things or did the build system break? All of those things fall into that. We won't go into detail of all of that. As you can imagine, that will break a lot of time frames with this. Um, but I just wanted to raise that there's a lot, lot of things to think about and there's a lot wider scope to think about than um, one would uh, first imagine when starting to think about that. Um, and uh, before we look deeper into all of that, let's have a look at a very simple application that we want to dive in a bit deeper um, and take that apart, which, uh, there, awesome. So uh, we've built ourselves a very simple program, similar to something that most of us have seen, I think, before. And um, we want to compile a little program, and then um, we can throw an S trace at that um, little program. Ah. Uh, no. And then see a whole lot of syscalls um, and things that happen. Um, and what I want to focus on, and what we're going to look at and dive in now, is that we start with a nice call of XV, which is a syscall that we use in that case to start our process. Um, and that will guide us through the further bits of what we're doing here. So now we've got a process. We want to start something. And we enter the Linux kernel and have this beautiful diagram, which we don't think, like, we never expected that to be readable from the audience. There's a whole lot going on. We enter here our user space, exit the e call, we go into a kernel space, we dive in here, and then down here we have a whole sub bit where we load our actual binary and the whole things start here. Um, so we've simplified that a bit for um, readability as a standard engineering practice. We enter, we allocate our uh, binary program struct. And M structs for the memory layout, allocating different kernel memory bits, um, look at arguments, environment, um, have initialized our struct here, search for a matching binary format, load the binary, return, execute startup code, and go back or start executing the main. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and again, in the interest of time, we could spend hours and hours talking about how we think from a functional safety perspective about all of these things and what can go wrong. Um, but that's not, I think, useful, feasible for today's talk. So we're focusing on smaller bits. Um, but before we look at smaller bits, um, that bit I wanted to quote, quickly talk about a bit further. So back in the user space, we also have some things to do. As most of you might have seen, we can either statically link or dynamically link. And then um, if we've statically linked, there's not a whole lot going on. But if we have dynamically linked, which will become important in a second, we either use um, our linker and loader that's defined in the interp section. Um, in the case of ELF, that's usually the LDSO. Um, and then with the LDSO, we can find and load shared libraries. Once we've done that, we hand over to the underscore start section, 
at the start symbol in the text section, and then we can enter main. Um, so now that we've defined all that and have a quick overview of what's going on, more or less, um, we can start thinking about what's actually going to go wrong, maybe, um, which is where I hand over to Steph. Hello. Uh, so I'm going to start trying to bring these two worlds together a little bit. Um, so what are the problem areas that we can identify in the application startup? Um, so perhaps the first point is quite an important one. It's the integrity of the binary data. Um, and what this means is the binary data we put in at compile time. We want to make sure that when we get to load time, it's the same data. It's not become corrupted in some way. Or from a security point of view, you could say someone's maliciously changed it. But we're thinking about kind of corruption not due to malicious intent here. Um, other problems that uh, could occur is we have these structures that we've loaded, um, initialized, put values in either from the system or from the binary we're loading. Um, we're setting up like the memory struct so that we know what the memory space is going to look like. If that doesn't get initialized properly, then when the application is running, we might have some problems. Um, so, and the same with the task struct describing the actual uh, tasks in the application. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of things in memory and also the stack and the registers initialization that we need to think about, like, if there's something goes wrong, um, if this doesn't get initialized how we expect it to, um, then we have an undefined state in our application once it started. So we're going through this idea of analyzing what's a problem that could happen in the application startup. Um, and once we've gone through the rest of the points here, we'll get to, OK, thinking about mitigations. Um, so we also could zero out our initial values. So some of you might know when you load an application, you might have some uh, un uninitialized static data that you want to load up. Um, you don't want this to just be random data, because perhaps sometimes one in a million it actually looks like real proper data, and your program goes, oh, I'm going to use that because it's nice, and it turns out that it's not nice and undefined state. Or um, So we want to make sure we zero out every value that we don't trust or we don't know what it should be at the start. Um, and then data handover. So this is when you run an application, um, on the command line, say, you know, you pass in some variables or some arguments, and also it passes in a whole, hope, um, whole bunch of environment variables. Um, those somehow go through the kernel and end up in your application. Um, but we don't want someone coming and, I don't know, passing in malicious variables. And we also don't want them getting corrupted unmaliciously. Um, so these are all the things we're thinking is what values could end up causing undefined behavior in our application, um, and how can we yeah, mitigate these problems? Um, the last one is slightly different. Um, so this is differentiate safe applications from non-safe applications. Um, yeah, This is perhaps saying we have a system where there's certain applications we care about starting safely, so we want to actually verify uh, mitigate these problems we've talked about. And then there's some applications that we don't care how they start. Um, we don't worry about the safety with them. We do worry about whether they're allowed to run or not on our system, but we don't have to verify they're starting because they're not safety critical. Um, so we can also say, how do we think about the problem of differentiating safe applications from non-safe applications? Uh, so what we're going to do in this talk is just focus on two of these points. So this safe versus non-safe, because without being able to differentiate safe versus non-safe, you could say, oh, OK, well, let's check everything. Let's pretend everything is safe. Um, and so we have to verify every application we start. But we say it's nice to also have non-safe applications running. Um, and then the other point that we'll focus on is this um, binary data uh, hasn't become corrupted between uh, 
build time and actually loading it into memory. Um, because, yeah, we don't just want some undefined code, perhaps, or undefined data being used once you've started your application. Um, but in the interest of safety, we would have to go back and look at all the other problems and figure out whether they also need some mitigations and then provide those mitigations to reduce the risk of problems caused. Um, yeah, so this isn't a full example of a solution, but this is what we have time for today to talk about. Um, yeah, so what we've seen so far is, well, we've seen roughly how an application is started on Linux, um, but we haven't seen what an application looks like. So you get given a binary, probably you've heard of the ELF binary format, but maybe you've not looked more deeply into it. Um, so we have this nice diagram, which uh, does kind of explain it, but I found it confusing when I first saw it. So what I found easier was to actually uh, take a program and pull it apart a little bit with um, some nice tools that you get. Uh, so we can use um, this ReadElf tool. Um, ReadElf allows us to look at, well, it has a bunch of different things it does, but what we're going to use it for is just looking what's actually in our binary, um, what kind of things like exist here. So we can see that this has got long addresses. It's a 64-bit binary, um, perhaps starting at the top. Uh, it tells us that we have 13 program headers. What does that mean? Um, so program headers are also called segments in the L format. Um, and they start at an offset of 64. So they're not the first thing we find. The first thing you'd find in an ELF binary is the ELF binary header, which tells us, um, let's say, less interesting information for this talk, and just kind of what version of ELF you're running, what's the architecture. So it would say it's being compiled for 64-bit, um, other boilerplate kind of information. Um, and then the next thing, interesting header we get to is the program header table which tells us about segments. Um, and then you can see here, we have program headers. So it's told us, where's my mouse gone? Uh, can I scroll? So we have, uh, is that, how, where did you put that? Uh, okay, so it tells us about the different program headers we have. It tells us where they are in, in the memory of the binary, perhaps where we want to locate them when we load it. Um, other information which we won't go into here. Um, but on this side, quite interesting, we have different keywords. So load is kind of self-explanatory. It's going to want to be loaded. Um, interrupt is an interesting one, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, but that contains the information about which interpreter to use when we're starting our application. Um, and then there's a few other types of uh, segment that we can have. Um, note is just comments that the, that the compiler can put in there for information and yeah. But the ones that are interesting for us really are load um, and the interrup. And then we come down here to more information. So this is the section to segments mapping. Now unfortunately segments and sections sound similar. It sounds like you could just interchange these words but they have two quite distinct meanings. Um, and as you can see here on the left, we have the segments. So 0 to 12, we have our 13 segments, like we found before. And then they have, in each segment, zero or more sections. Um, and anyone who's programmed in C for a while might recognize things like text, um, BSS is here, data. Um, so code, initialization data, um, yeah, like normal stuff you'd expect to find, and then also other bits of information perhaps coming from the compiler or from um, other parts of the system, which we won't go into, but... And then you can, if you remember um, from above, we also had this interrupt segment, and there's also an interrupt section, um, which uh, is going to be interesting for us when we start looking at what happens 
when we try and dynamically link our application on startup. Um, so that's just to show you that there's yeah, there's quite a lot of information going on, and the way the L format kind of represents it is with these two different views. But it's important to note that it's actually the same binary data. It's just segments are telling us here's our chunks, and these are actually the things that get loaded into memory. Um, and sections are uh, more related to the code or perhaps like the data or things that are going to get run by the uh, when we run the program. Uh, and then one last command uh, to get a bit more information out. Um, I said this interp section is interesting to us. So we can use objdump to actually just have a look what's in this interp section. Um, for anyone interested, the J is, allows us to specify a section, and the S just says print the whole section that I asked for. Um, and when we run this command, we see a nice hex dump of the binary information, but we also see a nice ASCII output of this uh, interpreter that our binary is asking for. So when it starts, it goes through the whole kernel information. Um, one of the last things it does in the kernel is say, oh, you want an interpreter, you're dynamically linked. When you return back to user space, it then goes to this path and says, please, Mr. Interpreter, find me my libraries that I need. Um, so, and perhaps also interesting to note is we say which interpreter we want to load the shared libraries. We don't say the shared libraries themselves. We don't have a list of, I don't know, six different shared libraries that we want to load. We allow the interpreter to figure that out for us. Uh, so, yeah. Now back to this diagram. So we have the ELF header at the start, um, and then we have the associated program header table and section header table pointing to the same information, but it just has two different views and is used slightly differently when we're loading our application. So now we know how roughly an application starts and also how an application binary looks. We can start thinking about how to mitigate the problems that we identified um, so, introducing our idea of an, uh, our idea of a solution, safe application startup. It's application startup made safe. It's, yeah. And if I accidentally call it Zapsu, because uh, that's quite a long title, so you know, it, it, Zapsu and safe application startup are the same thing. Um, so, what we can do is we can to mitigate these problems that we've identified. Uh, we can add some extra code into the kernel. We can also modify our ELF binaries a little bit at build time. So uh, it, it allows us to actually build in-kernel mitigations um, to, uh, yeah, I wanted to say solve these problems, but we're not, we're not trying to solve the problem of corruption at application startup. We're just trying to detect application startup corruption, and then we can react in some way when we detect that. Um, and then we've, yeah, to take it back to the safety world, when we've detected it, we can do something which then reduces the risk um, and, yeah, perhaps stops the system, perhaps, I don't know, warns someone that something bad has happened. Um, yeah. So the first problem we had was how do we tell when we want to actually start an application safely and verify what happens against when do we not care, when is it a non-safe application, it can start how it wants and perhaps end up in an undefined state. Um, and we also have this third case, um, which we didn't talk about before, which is, I don't know what this application is. It's a forbidden application, we'll call it. It shouldn't be running on our system. We didn't put it there. We don't know where it came from. Um, and so the way we mark an application as safe versus non-safe is we can add a little marker in the ELF header. It has a nice bit of unused padding, which we can just add a um, for example, a four-byte marker, um, and we say if it has this specific value, it's a safe application. We know what's in there. We've compiled it under special conditions that are controlled by us. We're happy for it to be started on our system, and it should be verified as a safe application while starting. Um, we can also say we can control non-safe applications at build time. They don't need to be started safely, but they should have a marker that says it's non-safe. So it's still okay to run on the system. 
Um, and so we can write in there a safety marker, a corresponding non-safety marker, and then anything that doesn't have one of these two values, we, it's either become corrupted or, yeah, it shouldn't be on there in the first place. Um, and so it can be detected once the application is starting. It doesn't have a value that we trust, and yeah, we can react in some way. Um, now, we add this safety marker to the binary that we want to run, but we also have to add a corresponding safety marker and do uh, corresponding controls on the interpreter that gets used because it doesn't make sense to start an application safely, um, verify what's happening during the startup if the interpreter can do whatever it wants. So we also have to add a corresponding control to the interpreter um, and likewise the shared libraries that might get loaded by um, an application that we want to start safely as well. Um, so, yeah, as a solution to the problem of starting an application safely and how do we know whether we need to or not, we have the safety marker. To the other problem that we had, um, how do we check the integrity of the binary data? Um, we can add, you can't really read it, but we've added our own section, also in its own segment, but which has checksums of all the other segments. So at compile time, what you can do is, for each segment that you put into your binary, take a CRC32 or a, um, some other checksum over this data, add it in here. So yeah, we have the checksums over all of this. Um, we add this sec uh, segment section into the corresponding tables as well. And then we add an extra bit into the kernel at load time. Um, which will check that when we're loading these segments, we do the checksum again, check it against this, the checksum that we have in the binary itself and make sure they match. If they don't match for some reason, then we can react again. So we know that, yeah, the data that we've loaded into the memory is the same as the data that was put there at compile time. Um, and you might say, well, what happens if one of the segments disappears? then because we have a certain number of checksums, we also expect a certain number of segments. Um, and so if those don't match, then we can react. Um, something in the header has become corrupted in some way, which affects like how the application is even going to be loaded. And so it doesn't load the segments properly. Then we'll see that as well, because it's, we're expecting a certain match between the segments and the checksums. Um, so it's quite nice, it gives us a good indication that actually the data has been loaded correctly and it hasn't, hasn't become corrupt somehow or changed somehow uncontrolled between compile time and actually loading it into memory. Um, and so we say, yeah, safe application startup mitigates these two problems by doing these two things. Um, obviously for a full solution, you'd have to go back through the other problems create corresponding mitigations for each of those as well. Um, but now perhaps we ask the question, does Zapsu solve our original problem or our original problems? Um, so yeah, I think I already mentioned it, but safe versus non-safe, if the marker is corrupt, so it's not safe or a non-safe marker, then we can react. If the shared libraries aren't marked correctly, we can also react. Um, yeah, if the checksums don't match, or if the header becomes corrupt and then it has a different idea about how many segments we might have, then we can react in some way. Um, yeah, there's a whole other talk probably about how to react to these things and what you should do um, when you detect problems like this. Uh, but again, we won't go into it here. Um, so how do we link this back to functional safety? So we've kind of gone through this very cut down idea of what we do as functional safety engineers. We analyze the problem space. We say, how is an application starting? What could possibly go wrong when we're starting it? Um, which problems do we actually need to mitigate? Like, do we really care if, I don't know, something completely unrelated to application startup happens? Probably not, but once we have identified the risks that we want to mitigate, we provide these mitigations, um, reduce our risk, and then at some point, 
we're happy with the solutions that we have and yeah. At that point, I think I hand over back to Tofu. Thank you. So where does that leave us? Now that we've gone through that process on a smaller example, cut down our bits, um, what was it that we wanted to look at with this whole ordeal? Um, we wanted to have a peek at functional safety because we think that's not that well integrated in a lot of FOSS practice software mindset. Um, I reckon if we rock up with these patches that we've written for that to the kernel mailing list, we will get asked for, say, an exploit or a live bug. And then we say, oh, we've done a lot of risk mitigation thinking. These are all problems that we can think about, but it's not a valid thing until I've written an exploit for it. So we want to start the discussion around that a bit um, and look at that and maybe raise awareness of that a bit. And the other thing is that we want to start looking at, can we bring functional safety and Linux together? Because we think that's a very exciting um, path to take towards. Um, we've then also looked at a more concrete bit. What does application startup on a Linux do? And so maybe some of you have not seen all of those bits of code and paths um, along the execution. Um, we've uh, brought along our favorite bit of analysis, mitigation, risk reduction, and repeat, which we can only repeat and repeat over and over again. Um, and then maybe that gets us at the end to some form of uh, risk that we can control, and then we end up with our magical TIF seal of approval, because that's what safety engineers care about a lot. Um, and then last bit, as you can imagine, this is only a small bit that we're starting with, um, because there's a whole topic and a whole wide thing that you can think about um, once you, you move into that space with Linux, um, and a lot more patches to write and a lot more things to do. Um, so there's a lot more talks to come, I think, in that space. Um, and patches and work. And uh, with that, I open for questions. Um, and I'll hand any question over to our two favorite colleagues, Norbert and Paul. Questions? Uh, so, yeah, I think the reason is just simply that you can have uh, end to end mapping between seg segments and sections. Um, so I think it's the same, it's just the same information used in two different places um, because, yeah. I Sorry? Yeah, I think so. Um, Um, I mean, the LibC is a topic just as wide as the kernel is, if you're thinking about that. Um, and there's a whole lot more things to, to think about what can go wrong in a LibC. Um, it, it's also that you are in the same memory space um, as you are with your libc as the application itself. So that ends up changing your way of thinking a lot. Um, uh, yeah, I, you can come over and waddle to the stand and we can sit down and talk about libc bits a bit. Because yeah, anything I can try now to put into, oh, this is what I'm doing with libc, um, we'll just not do it justice for thinking about the scale of that. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. In principle, there's nothing preventing you from using any language you feel like. Um, the IEC talks about some languages it likes and it doesn't like, um, and 
C and C++ without any constraints, it doesn't like, for example, um, unless you've put some constraints that you don't shoot yourself in the foot for obvious reasons. So, um, and the standards aren't that quick in picking up new developments. Rust is certainly a very interesting thing to look at in that space because it does a lot of things. Um, but, and here's the big but, um, you have to think about all of these things, not just for your online tools, so the things that go into your image, that go into your application, but also some offline tooling. Why do I know that my compiler outputs the right binary? And since C has been around for a few years, um, people have built and written and qualified and thought about risks of C compilers. So I can easily go out there and maybe buy a GCC or something like that for C. With Rust being that new, I'm not aware that someone's qualified a Rust compiler. And so while Rust is very exciting, I'm not particularly keen at the moment on sitting down and writing a whole lot of this risk assessment for Rust compilers and the whole, say, Rust standard lib, which has the exactly same problem, where I, there is people out there who have qualified libcs. Yeah? Ah. I mean, in principle, you're free to put that into a compiler, um, but then that means if you've bought a compiler, then you have to rethink about the risk of your compiler. So thinking about it from a maybe I'll do that afterwards perspective is probably the more cost-effective way of um, approaching that. Um, but then that gets you about thinking what can go wrong between my compiler and putting the checksums in there. And then I want to think about, I've run a whole lot of tests, maybe big test systems, um, and really I want to only put the checksums in the market in there once I've run the tests so that I know that the, the thing that's got tested is, is the thing that that's being used because if I put it in there before and then the tests go wrong and I know this, this thing's not not fit for service, then I've still got a binary that has valid checksums and markers. So there's a whole lot of engineering going into what the IC norm calls the offline tooling bits around verification and risk mitigations around that, where you have to think about what goes wrong in my testing system, what goes wrong in my build system, and how can I make sure that there's even some things like reproducibility or something like that when I think about that. Because, yeah, I, again, that's... Uh, Topics for five talks in that, um, as to how I think about build systems and what goes in there. Um, and feel free to waddle past the stand and ask more questions. Yeah. Just to add just one quick thing. Um, a nice thing to think about with that as well is having diversity in the checksum algorithms that you use. So perhaps you might use a different implementation to put the checksum in the binary in the first place than you use to recalculate it over the binary at load time. Because one thing you have to think about is systematic errors. If you use the same checksum algorithm implementation that has the same systematic errors, it might tell you, oh yeah, everything looks good because it's put the error there and then it's missed it when it's recalculated. So you can also, let's say, reduce more risk by thinking about, well, can we use diverse solutions? Um, yeah. It's, Hopefully that's also interesting. I don't know. Any more questions? Yes. Um, the IEC norm differentiates between pre-existing and newly created software bits. So the IEC does think about those things. Um, depending on how safety critical your bit of software is, there's a whole bit of things that you can do, ranging from writing a specification for the whole thing yourself and then testing it to death, um, towards doing a whole lot of uh, more formalized um, 
risk analysis bits and then mitigating for bits um, and maybe not even caring about what the software itself does. If I just wrap it or if I just put in enough diversity maybe even um, by doing the same thing twice with different software bits, then that helps me. Um, but in the end, with the pre-existing bits of software, you still will have to think a lot about the risk and specifying certain bits of behavior that you expect. Because you, un unless you've written yourself a nice specification, then you're going to have a hard time differentiating from what's going wrong to what's going right. Um, and then from that, you can think about, is it worth writing a test or is it worth mitigating that life or mitigating it other ways? Yeah? Does that give you? I, I think if you want to run a software that is not under your control at all, under a Zill level style thingy, then you're going to have a hard time convincing a TIFF assessor in pretty much all case. Like if I have a binary that I have no clue what's inside it, no standard and no specification, then I wouldn't trust my life to that um, if I like don't know that someone else has done the same rigor in, in thinking about that. So, yeah. Then by that time, you can just either start writing tests on your own, um, but you're not going to get, I think, very far with a, um, a full certification of that. Yeah? Any more questions? Yes? So I think if we think about that, we've broken the ELF standard by changing our binary. That implies that we've modified the kernel. There's some patches that need application to that kernel, and so it's not a mainline vanilla kernel um, when we add those. Um, and obviously, you're not done when starting an application. There's a whole lot of more things to think about than just the little bit that we've shown you there. So there's a whole lot of more patches that you need for that to think about. And one of those patches is thinking about how do I handle when something goes wrong and what do I do with that? Um, do I email my boss or whatever, you know, print a warning with the cup server that I'm running, which is certainly very safe to run. Um, but um, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I think there's a talk to come when we go into more detail and again, I'm, we can, I think, talk endlessly about how do I mitigate things that go wrong during the live system. Um, and a lot of the things won't end in emailing your boss, but. It starts adding up, obviously, um, and uh, since, as I've started with this, you know that there's at the moment not that much awareness for those kind of patches in the kernel, then you're going to think about how do I maintain or which bits do I put where very quickly. Um, but yeah, it's it's not just five lines of code that go into that. Um. So, uh, I preface this by saying I'm not so well up on the kernel development community. Like, I've, yeah, but I think one nice thing you could have is some kind of reaction, which tells you, oh, I found a problem, because that's effectively what we're doing is we're finding problems in startup and saying react to it somehow and you could perhaps have these patches in there and it's I don't know printing a warning or leads to a kernel panic or something people can decide what they want it to do for us we would want to reach this gold standard safe state which functional safety talks about you know it's for example, in the medical community, you have this kind of stop everything and don't let it continue because not doing anything is safe. So perhaps we would compile the kernel and say, okay, let's stop whatever's running. That's our safe thing. 
but you could also make it useful for other people by them saying, well, I just want a warning that gets printed out so I know perhaps I've written the code in the first place even and no one's ever told me it's gone wrong, but I can see the warnings now when I run it. And um, so it might even be useful, not in a fully functional safety, um, the German word is in my head, Bereich area. Um, but yeah, it can also be useful to other people perhaps when they say, I, I, I want to see when problems occur that don't necessarily get highlighted all the time. More questions? I mean, if you've looked at those slides, the marker itself is some form of signature and the checksums go into directions of things that you think about in security as well. And what we're saying is not security is exclusive to functional safety. There's a very strong overlap in a Venn diagram between safety and security because obviously one part of the risk in my functional safety is security. Um, it's just not the whole thing. Um, and so definitely when you do your functional safety assessments, you look at what has the security community done. What do they do? Um, what, say, things can I reuse that have been implemented since the kernel in particular has had a whole influx of bigger things in the name of security bits of, oh, I want to take these things and put them over there, and those things I want to put them over there. And certainly these things are very useful. Um, and you look at them. Yeah. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you very much. Um,